begin by saying this, you know, as I've shared before, I was raised in a religious system. We went to church once a year, and then we usually got away with playing sick. So that means I never went to church, you know, and we would do like the hair dryer on the thermometer, just that 80 stuff. You know, remember those glass thermometers? <laughs> you know what I mean? Not like today where they do a scan on your head. Y'all young folk, y'all don't know what it's like. Have that glass thermometer. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway, so we're heating it up and doing all these things. So essentially, I never went to church. And when I did go, I didn't know if it was English or Latin or what, you know? Um, I just knew that afterwards I was supposed to shake the father's hand. And my mom always said, shake the father's hand. And I knew what a pinch felt like because y'all know, you know, me and my brother get to acting up. You know what I mean? And then my mom, you know, a pinch or two and, you know, whatever. All that being said, I would grow up and have a disdain for the Bible. Uh, I would have a disdain really just for the God of the Bible, a disdain just for anyone that claimed they were a part of Christ. Um, I never had a personal problem with Christ uh, just as long as like it would just stayed way over there. Um, and then instead of continuing to live on this malnourished diet of hearsay, you know, when you hear the average person out there, Christianity is the white man's religion. And you know, there's contradictions in the Bible, right? And all these different things, they didn't come to these conclusions on their own. They're on a malnourished diet of hearsay. They're just spitting out what they heard in a song, what they heard someone in another religious uh, uh, institution or whatever. They're just spitting out. And I was that one. I'm a science major at an Ivy League university, and I knew better because you're taught there. You study and you research for yourself, and you don't ever just quote something without researching it. And I applied that to science, but how come when it came to what's you know, really the biggest conversation of all, God, and who are we in light of what God may have to say, I was just satisfied with just taking what other people said and just spitting it out, but saying it confidently as though I had researched it. Well, I decided to go and research for myself. And if anyone here today, if you're just a skeptic, if you're a critic, I would just invite you. I would even challenge you to read the Bible for yourself. When's the last time you sat and read it? When's the last time you studied it to actually just read of the person of Christ? And as I came to find who Jesus was, as I came to find Bible prophecy, and of 27 books on planet Earth that claim to be divine. Do you know there's some 27 different books on planet Earth that claim to be divine? The Quran claims to be divine. The Upanishads claim to be divine. 27 other books that claim to be divine. The Bible is the only book, the only book that has the audacity to supernaturally tell you detailed events before they happen. I will engage and talk with a Muslim and I will say, show me one thing that the Quran says before it happens. There is none. Because God has to be God in order to be able to, only the one who history belongs to can spit history to you before it happens. So as I came to see Bible prophecy, and I'd already studied ancient Babylon and ancient Egypt, and I'd already studied the Persians and Greeks and Hellenism and all these different things, and then come to find that Daniel prophesied of all these before they even happened? And then in 1948, the greatest archaeological discovery of all time, at least in modern human history, they find the Dead Sea Scrolls, which in the Qumran Valley in Israel, they found in a cave copies of the Old Testament, which when they looked at the coins that were in there, when they looked at the grammatical structure of the writings, when they looked at whose face was on the coins and dated everything, it clearly was before the times Christ came. Because what higher critics will say is, oh yeah, Daniel, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is definitely telling things before they happen. But that was written after Jesus came in some second century monastery closed room and they predated it like it happened earlier. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove that everything was indeed written before Christ came. Everything dated before the times of Jesus. So, yo, what we're holding here is God's word. And what we're holding here is the testimony of how God loves us so much of what he would do to save people like us. Now look, if you call my mama on the phone right now, my mama's gonna tell you that I'm sweet, 
My mama's going to tell you I'm kind. My mama's going to tell you I never heard a fly. Even when my mama hears about, she doesn't like to hear about, you know, when I was wilding out in New York and, and, and doing dirt and doing crime. She'll she, she like, oh, that was like, 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 like she gets deaf all of a sudden. No. Oh, Aaron. She might be watching online right now. Like, oh, they don't have to talk about that. Like, almost like if we don't talk about it, it's just not true. So the reality is all of our mamas might say real nice things about us, but the reality is that the Bible makes clear that we're sinners. We're born disrespecters. We're blasphemers. And not only do we do these things, but we like doing these things. God, who gives out laws and rules, he says, yo, I'm not just power tripping God. The reason I call these things sin is because it destroys it destroys minds, hearts, relationships. He doesn't say sin is bad because just to say sin is bad. He says it's bad because it destroys. And because God is a God of love and because love builds, God has to hate whatever tears down. Right? So he gave Adam and Eve the law that if you do this, you will die. Adam and Eve chose to walk in that rebellion. We've all since become sinners. But the reality is, Someone has to pay. The judge, even people in a city like Philadelphia will warn others, you don't want to go in front of that judge. Why? They'll throw the book at you, right? God, if anyone will throw the book at you, it is God. Because if he doesn't throw the book, he's no longer righteous. If he bends his own rules, he's no longer just. He's no longer pure. He's no longer holy. He has to throw the book at somebody. But here's the gospel. The good news is this. He loves us so much. He loves us so much. He threw the book at his son in our place as Jesus was nailed to a Roman cross. This was not Judas being slick. This was not Rome flexing its power. This was God's design all along. Jesus even told the 12 disciples long before Judas even betrayed him, did not I choose you 12 and one of you is already a devil? He orchestrated it. He told Judas on the night of the betrayal, what you're going to do, now's the time, do it and do it fast. He was the orchestrator of the whole thing while hanging in weakness. But you see, he took on our weakness. He took on our dirt. He took on our everything and here's the thing. Here's the enemy. It's not good news. Remember this. It's not good news unless it has an answer for death. If there's not an answer for death, it's not good news. He conquered death and rose from the dead. He conquered death. Remember this. A worldview that does not have an answer for death is not good news. He didn't just die for our sins, but he conquered death and rose from the grave forevermore. And here's the reality. Lazarus was raised from the dead. The widow of Nain's son was raised from the dead. Christ raised himself from the dead, ascended up into heaven, where he now sits on the right hand of the Father, praying for us as our high priest around the clock, and is coming back to split the sky. So here's what I want to share with y'all. First off, because this is what I, as, as a science-minded person, right, as a pre-med student, right, I, I, you had to think just logically, you had to look at facts. It wasn't about feelings. It wasn't about goosebumps. And oh my gosh, uh, you know, read that again. I think the hair on my arms is standing up. All that has its place, but it has to come down to facts. Christ fulfilling all of the prophecies of the Bible, facts. The historical accuracy of the Bible, facts. The scientific accuracy of the Bible, facts. And then not only that, but God did things. And he says in Isaiah 55, my thoughts and ways aren't like your thoughts and ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts and ways above your thoughts and ways. God did some stuff that nobody would have ever done. Because I like to just play devil's advocate, right? Let's, let's just say, and you know, that's not being a skeptic. That's just, a skeptic is when you're looking at something and you want to find holes. I'm talking about just looking at it and just using logic and walking. Through, like, let's walk this out if this were true. Let's walk that out if that were true. Write this down in your notes. Nobody would have, nobody would have invented Jesus the way he came down. Nobody would have. The second thing is nobody could have. Now, mind you, I'm still going to get to who is he, 
what he did and how we should live. So I guess you're getting two sermons today. Anyway, shall I stop, brother? No. <laughs> See, they make me feel good because I'm long-winded. No, um, now we're going to tighten it up. We're going to tighten it up. But let me, let me do this. Please pray for me, y'all. Please pray because I just want Jesus to be known. I want him to look good today. I want him to shine today because someone here today needs to rediscover him in a fresh way. In fact, we all do. We all do. Ready? Look, one, nobody would have. never. Yes, he fulfilled Bible prophecy. He fulfilled so much that even a university in Texas did a study. What would be the odds of someone just coincidentally, a statistics class at a university, what would be the odds of someone just coincidentally fulfilling just some 8 to 10 to 16 of those prophecies? Christ fulfilled a couple hundred they found that just the chance of someone coincidentally, just by accident being born in Bethlehem, just by accident going to Egypt like Isaiah 11 said, just by accident being called a Nazarene, just by accident riding his donkey into Jerusalem like Zechariah said, just by accident, all these different things, just by accident being betrayed for, by, for 30 pieces of silver like Jeremiah prophesied and Zechariah prophesied, what would be the chances of someone just coincidentally fulfilling just like eight to 10 of them? They found that it was one times 10 to the 187th power. One in a million chance is one times 10 to the sixth power. One in a billion chance is one times 10 to the ninth power. One times 10 with 187 zeros, just fulfilling just a couple handfuls of the prophecies. But aside from all that, aside from all that, nobody would have invented a Jesus like this. If people said, I want to create a world figurehead, a world ruler to lead a whole movement, the fastest growing movement on planet earth, no matter how much people are playing church, no matter how much someone right now is taking 18 offerings and fleecing the flock and what I call churchianity, right? Where you go in there and you see a lot of churchiness, but it's hard to see Jesus. No matter how much, this still is the most powerful growing movement on planet earth, okay? especially in Africa and South America right now. People having raw, real encounters with Jesus. Yeah. Nobody would have. Nobody who was trying to put him together fictionally would have ever had the leader come from a ghetto called Nazareth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have had him born from somewhere respectable. Nobody would have picked Nazareth. Nobody would have pick the world ruler to have no formal religious training at a time when you had to come out of the Judean schools under certain rabbis. It's all about who you know, right? No one would have made him a no-name rabbi from the Bama backwoods country from a ghetto called Nazareth. And Nazareth was so ghetto that when someone even said, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the dude stopped and was like, whoa, where'd you say he's from? Yeah. And then what did he say, Andrew? What good, name one good thing that can come out of Nazareth. No one would have had this fictional Jesus born there. No one would have had him born of a virgin to where all of his career he'd be called a bastard child. Nobody would have had him hanging with sinners and prostitutes. This is all of what our Jesus did. If people wanted to make a fictional Jesus to be believed in, nobody would have done. God did all of this. One, to show the heart of God, to show what is dear to the heart of God, the forgotten, the marginalized, to show, it says, though he was rich, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he became poor so that we now could be rich in him. But no one would have done this. Do you know women weren't allowed to testify in court back in ancient times? Who did God have be the first eyewitnesses to go and see the tomb was empty? Yeah. Women! <laughs> Nobody would have done that. I love his style, y'all. Maybe it's time for you just to sit back and be like, you know what, God? I like your style. Jesus came down, and the ones that thought they were all high up and knew everything, he sent them away scratching their heads and thinking. The ones that felt forgotten and looked over, he came and touched lepers. No one touched a leper. That's the equivalent of going and touching people with Ebola. Hanging with sinners, hanging with tax collectors, drinking wine with them, but remaining holy. N no one would have done this. That's what I said. Nobody would have if they were going to make Jesus up. And the Bible boldly says, wait, hold on. It gets deeper. Had 12 people on his team. One person on his team, after three and a half years, betrays him for the equivalent of $67. The other 11 run the minute he's arrested. They would have called that a failure. 
But what did he do? He came to show human hearts, even at their best, without God's spirit, are fickle and weak, no matter how strong they talk. But if people were inventing this, no one would have made this part of the narrative. They would have left all that out. Men would have been the ones seeing the one at the tomb. He would have had religious formal training. His team would have remained strong, and his team would have already been doing. They, no failures would be recorded of anything. Nobody would have done this. Next, nobody could have. Because you got to own history to run history. Born in Bethlehem, like Micah said hundreds of years prior. Born in poverty, like Isaiah said prior. Born of a virgin, like Isaiah said hundreds of years prior. Of the tribe of Judah, like Jacob prophesied over a millennia and change ago. Nobody could have. So I think I've kind of answered the first one already. Who is he? Who is he? Check him out, y'all. I mean, you have to know the cultural context to really understand a lot of what Jesus said, right? So we're from Philly, right? So if I say... Tony Luke's all day. Here we know what that is. If we say, yo, Tony Luke's got gems, we don't even have to say Tony Luke's cheesesteaks got gems, cheesesteaks. Hey, Tony Luke's got gems. Yeah. Or you say, like, yo, oh, it's getting warm. Rita's time. You see, we don't have to say Rita's water, it's just Rita's, right? Because we're here, we know the culture. Right? So we read a lot of things, and because we don't know the culture as well in the New Testament, we don't get the gravity of a lot of what Jesus said. So we're talking about now, who is he? Yeah. Yo, what about Luke chapter 6, verse 5, when Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath? What? The Sabbath that God instituted in the Garden of Eden and said six days you work, the seventh day you rest, it is my Sabbath. And he comes down and says, yo, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. See, we read over that in our Western, you know, culture outside of that, removed from that. Yo, who is he? He's God. Who else could say he's Lord of the Sabbath but God? What about in Mark chapter 2, verses 5 and 7, when he walks up, they bring the paralyzed man over to him. And while he came to, remember, Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 said one of the prophecies would be the Messiah would heal and give sight to the blind and cause the crippled to walk. But what does Jesus do? Instead of just fulfilling the prophecy of uh, causing this paralyzed person to walk, what's he do? He says this to him. Your sins are forgiven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did he just say? He didn't say, I'm a little saint you could put on the dashboard and I'll work in your favor on that day. No, he's like, yo, the day is squashed. I'll be there at that day. I'm telling you now, ahead of time, it's, gra it's good. It's gravy. It's good. Your sins are forgiven. And they said, what? Yo, who can forgive sins but God? Who could walk around and tell people like, yo, you got a clean slate because I say so? Who? Then he says, all judgment's been given to me. Healing lepers, Matthew 8, 4. Lepers had never been healed before. What about in Luke chapter 8, verse 25, when the storm is raging and he stands up in the boat and just rebukes the sea? And in Luke chapter 8, verse 25, they say, yo, what kind of person is this that even the winds and the water obey him when he commands them? What about Matthew 2? when he's just a baby and can't even goo goo gaga, and yo, magi, fire worshipers, kingmakers, a giant caravan comes from the east following a star, we've come to present gifts and to find the king. Where's the king? And then what about Matthew 8, verse 29, when demons even run up? Demons, lion demons. But they had one thing straight, they run up to Jesus and confess, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, the Son of God? Yeah. Demons confessing. So one, who is he? He's God. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's an insult to say he's anything else. Jesus is Lord. Jesus yeah. is God. Yeah. That's why he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. They said, wait a minute, you're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about? Abraham saw you. He said, verily, verily, before Abraham was I am. And how they got the context because they grabbed stones to stone him because they were accusing him of blasphemy. What they didn't realize is that Jesus is saying who he really is. So Jesus is God. 
Let that sink into your hearts. Let's fall in love with him again. Everything he did was with purpose. Every miracle, every person he dined with, he came to show us his heart. Jesus is God. So who is he? He's God. What did he do? What did he do? The Jehovah's Witnesses will try to tell you that Jesus is really just Michael the archangel. Jesus came down as God in the flesh. And what did he do? He died on our cross in our place. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Do you realize that all this today is about is one thing, forgiveness? It's all about forgiveness. And it's kind of like, well, forgiveness, look, I I know people at work, uh, I'm forgiven, um, at least I think I am, but I, my coworker, like, they, like, laugh at all this. And, you know, I get a delicious lunch, they get a delicious lunch. I get a pay raise, they get a pay raise. I get vacations and post it and live in my best life and YOLO, and they do it. I tell you what, when everyone breathes their last breath, you'll understand what forgiveness means. Because it says in the Bible, it's appointed to man to die. You don't know when you're going to die, but the only, only sin that he will not forgive, the only sin is dying without making him Lord and Savior. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you're telling that Holy Spirit that's touching your heart like this saying, you need this, you need this, you need this. You're calling the Holy Spirit a liar. I disagree with you, Holy Spirit. You've blasphemed God, the Holy Spirit. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But it says on that day, mercy rejoices against judgment. When we see the books open, when we see the dead raised and we see people judged according to their works, we will rejoice like never before that our pages have been made blank by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But blessed are those that get it now. Blessed are those that understand it now. Blessed are those that can rejoice in that now because today is about forgiveness. Romans 4.25, write that down. And we may tie this up and may not get into a whole bunch of scriptures, but you've already gotten a handful anyway, more than a handful. Romans 4.25 says he was delivered for our offenses. When Jesus hung on that cross, it was for all of our sins. And then it says he was raised for our justification. Jesus hung on that cross and said, it is finished. In Aramaic, it means paid in full, to telestai. How does God feel about that? In other words, Jesus hung on the cross and said, everything Aaron ever did, paid in full. Put your name in it. Everything, everything paid in full. How does God the Father feel about that? The resurrection shows that the payment of Jesus, his blood sacrifice, was enough to wash all of our sins away, all guilt, all shame, all gone, new creatures in Christ. That's why the resurrection is everything. It does two things. Romans 1, 4, and 5, it shows that he is indeed God because he kept telling people, I'm going to raise from the dead in three days. If it were two days, he'd not be God. If it was four days, he'd not be God. If it was 3.99 days, he would not be God. It shows he's God because he came back and rose from the dead exactly as he'd been telling people. So one, the resurrection makes clear that Jesus is God, Romans 1.4. Two, Romans 4.25, it shows that his payment is enough. So if there's anyone here today and guilt still gets you, There's anyone here today and shame still gets you, but you've received Christ. You've got to really study him more and you have to study this word until it renews your mind. You see what a lot of believers want is they never want to read their Bible, but they want all the benefits to come as if they know Jesus. They don't want to read their Bible, but they want all the right answers when the lies from the devil come. We've got to study him. We've got to know him. It says in Isaiah 64, verse 6, we are all as an unclean thing, and even our righteousnesses are filthy rags in his sight. The Hebrew word for filthy rags is used menstrual cloth. That's the best that you can do in God's sight. You only have one option, accept the gift of his son. Accept the gift of his son. It even says in Galatians, if there's any other way to be righteous, Christ died for nothing. Micah chapter 6 verse 7 says, Can I give the, what if I gave the Lord thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of the purest olive oil? What if I even gave him my child? How many of y'all love your babies? What if I gave my own child the fruit of my womb to show how repentant I am 
says, none of that will do. He has shown thee, O man, what the Lord requires of thee, but to walk humbly with your God. And that is through the cross of Jesus Christ, where righteousness and peace, it says in the Psalms, have kissed each other, where mercy and truth have met. You understand, apart from the cross, this is what it should say. Righteousness and wrath have met each other. God has to be righteous. The wrath has to meet us. It should not say mercy and truth. It should say truth and judgment have kissed. But because of what he did on the cross, because he took all of our sins to that cross and showed it even beautifully by getting on, who was that cross even chopped down for? Were the workers in the woods chopping it down, singing about Jesus being nailed to it? No, it was meant for a man named Barabbas, a murderer. And the crowd called for Barabbas to be freed instead of Jesus being moved by the religious leaders, if you remember. That means that that was Barabbas' cross. Christ truly got on a cross that was not his. And guess who the real Barabbas is? Us. Bar means son. Abba means father. He was the son of the father, but not God the father. He was the son of the devil. And Christ got on his cross for him. And that's why mercy and truth can now meet. That's why righteousness and peace can now kiss. They kiss at the cross. Yo, if you've been forgiven by the Lord, rejoice. Look, I don't care if you look in the mirror and you feel like you still see nothing but a hot mess. But guess what? If you belong to Jesus, you're his hot mess. I don't care if you look in the mirror and sometimes you ever just look at yourself like you, you talk to him, you make me sick. But I tell you what, because you've asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you might make you sick, but the Father looks at you and says, this is my son and daughter with whom I'm well pleased. Do you understand what Jesus did for you? Do we really get it, or do you just want to come play church? Do you just want to come in here and we throw out some kumbaya and be nice to people and buy Girl Scout cookies in the lobby and, and you know, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you? Or do we really want to get rocked by Jesus in a day that's rocking us with so much else? So much else is rocking us. Come on, y'all. Think of what rocks you during the week. And you, the, those of y'all getting rocked by Jesus, don't get all self-righteous. Well, Jesus rocks me during... Well, praise God. That's the right answer. But let's keep it a bean. What rocks you during the week? What rocks you during the week? All you got to do is look at what you do during your me time. You can see what you're devoted to. Just, just play the tape back and see what you do most. That's what you're devoted to. That's where your worship is. But do you realize that doesn't... Ha- God's not insecure about this day. God just looks down and sees children that are just missing out because they're not tasting and seeing that he's good. So therefore, they're thirsty and they're going around and just tasting and getting just nutri-sweet. Getting, you, you, you know, you remember before you, you found out stuff was fake sugar and, and all of what it did to you? It was like the newest craze, nutri-sweet everything. Now studies are showing nutri-sweet is actually worse yeah. than drinking a real Pepsi. Yeah. So by the way, drink a, it's actually safer to drink a real Pepsi yeah. than to drink you one of them zero Pepsis. Yeah. But, but we didn't realize that at first. It was always the best thing since sliced bread. Well, that's what everything else that's getting us now. It's nutri-sweet, and it is affecting us. We need to go to the real sugar, yeah. the real honey out of the rock. Yeah. Back to Jesus. All right, this is my last closing. So in light of what he did for us, y'all, and look, I wish I had more of your time because I would take y'all through Matthew 27. I would go to Isaiah 53 just to read all of what he did. You know what I'm saying, brother? Just read it this morning. Oh, man. (laughs) Don't tempt me, brother. All right. Um, But look, how shall we live? In light of all of this, how shall we live? Because here's the reality. Churches are going to be packed today. Right? Some places rent entire arenas out and all of this and all that. God bless them. I don't want none of that, by the way. I, <laughs> I love just what we got here. You know what I'm saying? You, you will never see it. Like, praise God. I hope every pastor can say that. I, just the amount we got here, this is right for us. Antioch is a lot like a pit bull. You know why no matter what size dogs people have, when a pit bull comes outside, the big Newfoundland goes in the house? The shepherd goes in the house. You want to know why? Because pit bulls have a low center of gravity. Pit bulls have very little body fat. And whatever pit bulls bite, they don't let go of. I like to think of our ministry. We've always called ourselves a pit bull ministry. Low center of gravity. We like to get down and dirty. We like to roll our sleeves up. 
little body fat. People look at the size of our church and look at how many people come out to serve and to get busy. And then whatever we bite onto, by God's grace alone, we try not to let go of it until the Lord says, no matter how hard it gets. So praise God for y'all for making this what it is. Because I'm just a preacher. Y'all are the body. You know what I mean? Praise God for who you are in everything you do. And don't let the devil lie to you about how he's using you and what God is doing, because God is doing a work. I mean, you think it's a coincidence that I'm driving home from Level Up, you know, four weeks ago from a night of explosive level up, and I'm on the phone with Pastor Sherman, like, my brother, it's 12.30, one in the morning. I'm driving a bunch home. He's driving a bunch home. Then we call each other on the phone. I've done been, he's done been to Camden. Hoods in Camden where Uber drivers cancel when they even get here and realize that the kid wants to go to that part of Camden. We'll get five cancellations. Does that show up? Cancel. Show up? Cancel. <laughs> it's like they're pulling up like, <laughs> wait, 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 let me sip my coffee again. They, they're going, where? No, cancel, right? So we'll drive them home. Then we always get on the phone and recap the night. And we're recapping the night, and I look right over my shoulder, and a drunk driver blows an intersection and T-bones me to the accident. I should have died. Hit me so hard, my car came up on two wheels, totaled the vehicle, bananaed it, and I took the whole hit right here. Went away, neck brace, ambulance, the whole nine. Four blocks from my house. Then two weeks later, I'm on the phone with Sherman. I'm back to driving again because level up. Hey, Jesus. He lives. He's risen. On the phone with Sherman. Sherman, another great night, Mel. Praise God. 1230 again, 1 a.m. Maybe we should stop talking on the phone at 1 a.m. after level up. <laughs> then Sherman's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Drunk driver's coming toward me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Boom. He gets hit. I tell you, praise God that he has us doing a work here that has the devil's attention. Because we're here to show, because he is risen and because the kingdom of God has begun in us, when he returns, he will set up his global kingdom. But we are a first fruits. We are a representation of what the kingdom looks like. And we're going against another kingdom that wants to steal and kill our children, wants to turn them out, wants to destroy them and have them destroy one another. And we're going against that. And praise God but we couldn't do it without everyone here. So if I've just not taken the time just to say praise God and thank you, praise God and thank you. Because you realize this, I hope y'all get this and then I'm, I really gotta go. Do you know this is actually our new year? You see, we talk about January 1st new year. You see, we talk about you know Chinese new year and different new years and we follow, oh, this so-and-so's new year, a Greek new year. This is our new year when the Lord redeemed the Israelites and had the lamb slain and the blood put on the doorpost. He said in Exodus 12, this is now the beginning of your year. Yo, y'all, when's the last time you meditated on that? This is new year for us. This is the year when we get to reflect, look back, thank the Lord, and then make some decisions about how we're going to, oh, you thought it was only January 1st? No, this is the new year, but here's the difference. We have the boldness his love for us and what he did for us, and we have his spirit. Because it says in Romans 8, if the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So we actually have the forgiveness. We have the ability to not just say, I changed my mind, I want to live different. We have the forgiveness so we truly don't ever have to look back. Philippians 3.13 says this, forgetting what is behind. Only a Christian can literally look back and say, I'm forgetting that. Why? Well, New Agers could try it. I was a New Ager. I tried all the time. And it said, go to the purest rivers and stand on the river and, and allow the water to take your negative energies and burn lavender. I did all that stuff for hours. Uh, drove hundreds of miles to certain mountains to do it. Sincere, just sincerely wrong. And I'd still come down and feel, why is the shame and the guilt and the dirty feeling not leaving me? But you see, when we talk about the blood of Jesus, it's not just an idea, it's power. There's power in that blood. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Come on, y'all. They say if you want to grow your hair, just scratch your scalp a little bit because the stimulation just of literally stimulating your scalp causes blood to flow there. And when blood flows there, it means extra hair growth. Your hairstylist didn't tell y'all that. <laughs> so if just your blood flowing to another part of your crazy body can cause life to go, how much the... Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, y'all. How much more the blood of Jesus? So look, how shall we then live? His blood is talking. His blood is cleansing. His blood is making new. Old things are behind. Looking forward. 
Paul tortured Christians, persecuted Christians with the sword, made them blaspheme Jesus with the sword before he was radically converted. You looked at a man, he said, there's no condemnation in Christ. You don't think the devil tried to whisper in his ear and give him dreams of what he did and remind him of who he was? Someone once said, when the devil reminds me of my past, I remind him of his future. And we also have God's spirit. So I would encourage you to read Romans 8. Really let it sink in that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Holy Spirit you have. And you don't have to speak in tongues to get it neither. You got it already and by his spirit. But here's the thing. You got to feed the spirit. The spirit in you, oh, it's God almighty. But as the Holy Spirit's connected with your spirit, you've got to feed your spirit. Because you can starve the mess out of the Holy Spirit within you. There was a Native American Christian who once said, you know, in my heart, it's like there's two dogs fighting. He was talking about his old new nature and Christ with the spirit and the old nature and the old selfish, nasty ways. He said, there's two dogs fighting in my heart. Somebody said, well, which dog is winning? He said, whichever dog I feed, whichever dog I feed. So how shall we live? How shall we live? The Bible says this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and oh, there was a lot of scriptures we were going to read today, but, you know, y'all go and read them. I would encourage you to read Matthew 27, read Isaiah 53, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How shall we live? And this is where I'm going to end. And let's have the worship team come up, please. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. It says, for the love of Christ constrains us. Because we judge, what constrained means is it pushes me forward. There's times as a believer I don't want to do the right thing. There's times as a believer I don't want to give sacrificially. There's times as a believer I just want to wrap up in my comforter and just lay down and and, and, find a cave and go live in it and check out. But he says, there's a different thing. The love that Jesus has for me is what moves me. I don't, if I only read the Bible every time I actually wanted to head over heels, if I only prayed, I, I, I want to no. know the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus pushes me to do things even when I'm, quote, unquote, not in the mood. He says, because I judge this, if one died for all, then we were all dead. And here's verse 15. And he died for all. And here it is. That they which live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and who rose again. So how, how should we live? Romans 8 even comes in and says, now we're debtors. We owe God our lives. He bought us with his blood. Yeah, you may have just had a crazy 2020, a crazier 2021, but you could sit here today and say, you know what, Lord? Maybe some years haven't reflected it, but I'm I'm here. I know I'm yours, and I'm being reminded of what it means to be yours, and here I am. And just like the prodigal, you just come back. And you can learn the Christian life is many, many new beginnings, many, many. We see that even with the disciples, many, many new beginnings. Today, let this be your new year where you actually bring your heart right, you know? And then basically, here's the last thing I want to get into. We have to study who Jesus is. Here's a book. I recommend every one of you get it. It's called Rediscovering Jesus. I'm reading it actually from my grad school program. Uh, For my elders here, uh, (laughs) Isaac, Brandon, you know, Eric, I got y'all one already. You know what I mean? You already got one, all right? Uh, The rest of y'all get one, okay? Um, (laughs) If you're broke, though, and you really want it, holler at us, okay? Rediscovering Jesus, and this is what he's getting into. And and check this out, and then I'm going to leave it. It's going to blow you away what I'm about to share. He says this. We need every story of Jesus, every gospel writer's story of Jesus to understand the full Jesus. He says the problem in the Western church is we really only focus on John's Jesus and Paul's Jesus. He says that's why we're content sitting down a lot, just listening to messages a lot, taking notes of messages a lot, and then discussing doctrinal points together a lot. That's necessary, but that's only a part of who Jesus is. He says we have to study. What about Mark's Jesus? 
No preaching really in the Gospel of Mark, but he's engaging demonic powers in chapter one. He's engaging Roman power, preaching the kingdom of God in the subsequent chapters. That is the apocalyptic Jesus. That is a Jesus who's not sitting still. It's all action. What about the exiles, Jesus? First Peter, second Peter, James, writing to the scattered tribes where it's saying, be ready to suffer for Jesus. So he says this, here we tend to focus on John and Paul, doctrine and, and the mystical aspects of Jesus. And it just reflects that that's it. Imagine if we all studied Luke's Jesus. Luke is the gospel account that talks about his prayer life. Imagine if all we had was the gospel of Luke. How many prayer meetings would we have in the church? How much would prayer be a part of the church bulletin, right? Convicting for all of us to hear that. You get it now? You, we need to study every Jesus. Otherwise, we start picking and choosing the, the parts of Jesus that we like, and we end up with a lowest common denominator Jesus. That's what he's getting into in this book. Unbelievable for him to hit this on the head. What about James? What if we only had the Jesus that James writes about? Every one of us would be serving the poor. Every one of us would be looking at favoritisms. Every one of us would be saying it's not about what you, what you say and how you talk it. It's about how you live. It's about what you do and what have you done for the Lord lately. He's saying our problem is we have to rediscover the full Jesus. Let me read you the quote that he says. He says, This smorgasbord Jesus doesn't hurl epithets at women or make demands of slaves. In the cafeteria buffet, he says, I like dessert when I'm in a cafeteria buffet. So I want a sweet, agreeable Jesus, the one who likes what I like and the one who hates what I hate. Everyone agrees that child trafficking is bad, so let's talk about the Jesus who loves children. But I'm uncomfortable with a Jesus who might disapprove of my purchase of the latest high-tech gadget when there are millions of children who don't even have enough to eat. So I avoid sayings of Jesus that might suggest that. Frankly, my Jesus isn't overly concerned with the things I'm not overly concerned about. When we create a composite Jesus, we risk losing Luke's Jesus or Matthew's Jesus, leaving us a Jesus of the lowest common denominator, or worse, a Jesus made up of the parts that I like. We can create a Jesus of the lowest common denominator or a Jesus overshadowed by the picture that we most prefer. We need to no longer have the luxury of pretending that white Western males are the only ones whose opinions matter. Could African and Asian voices help us even see Jesus better? When Jesus asked his followers, who do people say that I am? He wasn't just curious about what his followers believed. He wanted to know what the crowds were saying. I would encourage you guys to get this. And actually the chapters are just divided up. I mean, Chapter 1, Mark's Jesus. Chapter 2, Matthew's Jesus. Chapter 3, Luke's Jesus. Chapter 4, John's Jesus. Chapter 5, Paul's Jesus. Chapter 6, the priestly Jesus. Uh, and then it gets into the Gnostic Jesus, the Mormon Jesus, and everything. I would encourage you guys to get this book. It's, it, it's unbelievable, you know. So <sighs> let's close, and I just want to read to you guys what I wrote when I was at the empty tomb 13 years ago. I said, Lord, Lord, I sit here and I simply can't believe it. I simply can't believe it. I am here beholding the place where Jesus, where you tasted death for every man, for me and for my precious Tasha. Lord, you conquered death, the death of death, and you were raised for my justification. Lord God, I worship you. I worship you. I thank you, Lord. Lord, please, Holy Spirit, please shed abroad the love of God upon my heart. Please, Lord, please, Lord. I repent, and at this moment, I count everything as feces, even my own life, that I can know you and the fellowship of your sufferings and the power of your resurrection. Lord, the sounds of the exotic birds around me and above me, the warm sun on my neck, the sounds of other believers humbly worshiping you, Lord, prepare my heart for communion. Hallelujah. And then I wrote this. To remember and brood over my sin is a denial of his love. 
I was like, whoa, Lord, I didn't know I'm capable of writing something like that. <laughs> Basically, what I was saying is, for us to focus on our sin and our failure is denying his love for us. Let's really let his love sink in. Father, we just thank you for this gathering today and this time. And Lord, we just thank you for all of what you've done. And we want to rediscover you and we want to just know you and pursue you. And we want our lives to look like we just want to know you more. We just repent and we take this new year to really celebrate this Nisan, this, this beginning of months that you said in Exodus 12. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing among us. And Lord, even now, would you receive an offering from us as worship to you? Thank you for all of what you've done today. And Lord, now we can worship you with giving. And Lord, may it be used, Lord, there's so much work to do, so much work. May it be used for the building of your kingdom, because you said the gates of hell, the headquarters, the stratagems of hell will not prevail against your church. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.